Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today is Tuesday, November 19th of 2019. My name is Fear Dragon, and we're gonna do something a little bit different today. It's still going to be somewhat gaming related, but this is all going to be very much in the context of learning. This is gonna be an educational stream. This is going to be a stream about teaching people how to do something that I think should be a life skill because it's helped me so much throughout my life not only in my career, but just in general day-to-day -day things, and that is programming. Today, I'm gonna teach you guys how to code. So, let's talk about what exactly that means. Uh, first of all, what is programming? Programming is the easiest way to understand it, because of course, I'm sure everyone has heard or seen random little things in the media, or people talking about what is coding, what is programming, and all this stuff. So the way I like to think of it is, programming is a way that you're basically speaking to your computer. You're telling your computer, who is quite willing to do whatever you tell it to do until the robot or uprising at least, but you're telling your computer what you want it to do. And programming is the language that we're using to communicate with it. At a really deeper level, if you really dive down into it, whatever language that we tell the computer we want it to do something in, gets translated into another language, which sometimes even gets translated into another language, which finally the computer can read and then it'll execute those commands. So it is a very roundabout process. And because of that, a lot of the issues that people have with coding, a lot of the difficulties are basically translating your thoughts on what you want your computer to do accurately. Because a computer will do exactly what you tell it to do. 99.999% of the time, it will do exactly what you tell it to do. And the problem is usually not that the computer is doing what you told it to do wrong, it's that you're telling it to do the thing that you want it to do incorrectly, or you're missing a step, or you're forgetting about something else that you told it to do. So, programming, why is it useful? Well, it can automate all sorts of parts of your lives. Um, a really easy example is when I was in high school, uh, actually, it was a little just after high school. Uh, I got a speeding ticket. I got a speeding ticket. I had to go online to the California DMV website. And, you know, they made me take this really, really long course. And I didn't really want to. I mean, it was just all these multiple choice things on really, really simplistic stuff. Uh, and they didn't really care whether or not you got the answers right or wrong. If you got the answers wrong, you just were asked to take the test, exact same test again. Multiple choice answers stayed the same and everything, like the positioning. So I thought, you know, I can write a program that does this for me. So I saved myself negative an hour because I spent more than an hour doing this. But if I ever need to do the DMV stuff again, I have that. My brother-in-law needed to go get a visa to another country. And... What happened with that is he had his trip coming up in like three weeks, but he needed to get uh, like an appointment with the, the whatever the people for the visa two weeks in advance. So he was spending that last week thinking, oh my God, if I can't get an appointment this week, I can't go. So he was going to this online website to try and sign up for appointments. And guess what? There are no appointments, but... There's also no system to let you know if there's a newer appointment freed up or anything. So, in about an hour, maybe 35 minutes or so, I was able to quickly write a little script that just said, hey, every minute or every five minutes, check if there's an appointment. If there is an appointment, email my brother-in-law. If there isn't, okay, we'll check again in one to five minutes. And through that, he was able to get his appointment in time and actually go on his awesome bachelor party, I think, in some other random country. So a lot of these cool things can work. I mean, I actually have a script right here that will completely kill my uh, green screen effect that turns my lights on and off. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you can do with the press of a button. You can turn your lights on and off. You can write things and utilities that are useful for you. A lot of my Twitch broadcast is heavily influenced by my ability to write programs. So hopefully that just gives you guys some idea of some of the possibilities open to you if you do decide to learn how to code. So next up, I should say, who am I? Because I have mentioned I make my living, most of my living off of software development. Uh, in the past, I have attended, uh, I got a bachelor's degree in computer science. 
I've worked in the industry for around five. It's kind of weird because people sometimes consider internships as part of the time that they add for their work experience. But depending on how you look at it, like five to seven years I've spent working in the industry. I've worked at big companies like Amazon. I've worked at like somewhat smaller companies like Yelp. I've worked at startups where there were only three or four engineers there. Uh, so I've had some experience, but I'm going to also preface and say everything I'm telling you, you can also learn online. If I am not the right resource for you, then please seek out some other alternative resources because there are some really, really great resources out there. A lot of what I'm going to try and do is heavily geared at, I'm not going to lie, I'm going to be making a lot of StarCraft references here. So if you guys are coming in through the uh, some other form and you don't know what StarCraft is, please bear with me with all the StarCraft references. That's the way I think about things and also that's the most of the people who watch my stuff. So with that being said, uh, let's talk a bit about how do you get started? So I actually did link out, uh, not too long ago. And I actually forgot to get this link ready, uh, for anyone in the chat. There is one thing you need to download. There is one thing you need to be set up for today. And that is going to be Python, the programming language. Uh, there are a lot of different programming languages out there. And like I said before, programming languages are how you communicate with your computer. And there are different ways you can actually do that. Now, we're going to be using Python because I think it's a very easy language to get started with and it's very, very powerful and I think most importantly, for people who just want to casually learn how to do some coding, quickly get started and be useful, do useful things without spending four years getting a bachelor's degree in computer science to learn other languages like C++ or Java and all this other stuff. I feel like Python, you can hit the ground running really quickly. And by the end of this, I want us to actually be able to do something cool and useful. So my goal at the end of this is that I have access to a Python library that reads StarCraft II replay files. So by the end, we're going to be reading a little bit of data from those replay files from say X number of our replays. And we're going to be getting the average game time for a bunch of the replays that we look at. And I think that's really cool. I think that's super cool. And hopefully this will also set you up with the general basic tools you need to look at a bunch of other types of things on the internet and say, hmm, that looks really cool. I wonder if I can do something like that. And you won't necessarily have everything you need to know from this, but I'm hoping that I can provide you guys the tools you need to go seek out the information you want. That's going to be a big part of this. So some of what I plan to do today, I'm actually going to be showing you guys like web pages and saying, this is what, you know, a library looks like. If you want to use someone else's code that they've written, they've made this tool for you to use. How do you use that so that you don't have to do most of the work? You just kind of have to plug and play. It's a tool. It's a gear that you're just plugging in. Because I really do believe the modern day and age, especially for people who are interested in doing like hobbyist coding and software development, a lot of what you're doing is actually not what many people would expect. Many people would expect you're writing stuff from scratch. You're doing a lot of things totally on your own and building things out of nowhere. But in reality, the way that I think about coding is it's a lot of gears. You're taking different gears and you're assembling them together in different ways. And there are some people who are incredibly smart and they create their own gears but then you can just go use those gears and plug them in and kind of massage them, make sure that they're all in the right order and you've created something new yourself. That's the way I like to think of coding it is plugging in the right gears in the right places to get what you want. So with all that said, let's talk about what you will need because I still need to actually grab that. You need to download Python. If you haven't downloaded Python already, uh, I probably should have actually opened up by telling you to download Python for the people who are watching the live stream because um, I would have given you some time to install it. But we're going to be using Python and I'm also going to be assuming that you're on Windows because my primary audience are people on Twitch and people on Twitch tend to use Windows because they're usually playing games and they're usually into a lot of that kind of stuff. So I'm going to link in my Twitch chat and also in the YouTube video down below if I put this on YouTube. Um, the link to the Python download page. So this should be catered to whatever specific uh, like operating system you're using Windows, Mac, Ubuntu, whatever you can uh, want to use. 
Now, the way that uh, you'll have a big list of things there, you can use anything from Python 3.4 onward. That's the only thing, just Python 3.4 or higher for this tutorial. I would highly recommend trying out Python 3.8 or something right now, at least, because, you know, I like I like playing around with the latest versions. I think that's cool. Um, for me, I'm going to be using around Python 3.7. It's not going to be a huge difference or a deal between the versions. Uh, again, we are going to be using Windows. And I already see some people in the chat. And by the way, hello, everyone in the chat. Uh, apologize. I promise I'm going to be doing a big Q&A later on. I'm going to try and go through this, try and keep this time efficient for people and not get too, too involved with answering so many questions unless there's something really pressing. Um, but someone's already in the chat is talking about IDEs. And for those who are wondering what an IDE is, think of an IDE is basically the program that you write your programs in, right? It's the place where you are typing in all of your like text for your programs. And then that eventually gets turned into the program itself. Now, here's the thing. There are a lot of IDEs available. We're not even going to be starting with the IDEs though, all right? I'm going to talk about IDEs or basically they're editors. They're, they're text editors in a sense with additional tools. We're not going to worry about them. Don't worry about an, what a text editor is or IDE or anything, all right? Because we're going to address that later today. And even that is very, very preference-based. I will personally be using my IDE of choice, which is something called Vim. I actually wouldn't recommend it for people who are just getting into coding because it's something that I really like, but it has a huge ramp up, uh, which will feel very unnecessary and overwhelming if you are just trying to get into coding. It's a huge, huge overhead, so I wouldn't recommend that. Don't worry about that for now though, because we're not going to use it for a bit. Now, what I need you guys to do Assuming you've downloaded and installed Python and all that good stuff, I need you guys to follow along with this. I want you to hit the Windows key. So Windows key. And then I need you to type in CMD. And what this stands for is Command Prompt. Now, this is again assuming a Windows computer, but we'll go ahead and hop over here. Now, you guys can see over here, this is my desktop. I have a cool Pokemon background. That might actually change randomly. This is what a command prompt looks like. Command prompt is one of the primary ways that you can run programs. And this is actually something that you'll be using a lot. I just wanted to talk about this so that you have some context on this kind of thing. This is what you always see in the movies is like elite hackers using and all that stuff. Um, there's other versions of it on different operating systems. You might hear that it called bash or a cup shell or a couple other things. So, that is just one tool in your tool belt that you'll have to worry about. But what I want you to do is I want you to actually type in Windows key again, and I want you to just type in Python. And hopefully you should see if you just installed your instance of Python, you should see something called Python, like some app that says Python 3.7 or 3.8 or whatever. And it's gonna actually look pretty similar to our command prompt, but it's important you don't get these mixed up, okay? These are actually fairly different. So this, we're just gonna put over here, we're gonna make this nice and small because we're not worrying about that. This is what we're gonna be doing a majority of our stuff in today, all right? So what this is, is this is called a Python console. The way that this works is, unlike a lot of normal programming, this is gonna be a perfect playground for us to just learn and try things out in Python. There's a huge number of things that I can go into, but we're gonna skip over for now on what an interpreted language is and what a scripting language is and what a compiled language is. Don't worry about any of that. All you need to know right now is that if we type something in over here, our computer is going to process whatever we type in here and execute it immediately, okay? That's all you need to know. So. What does a program look like? What, where do we even get started? Well, there is a tradition in all coding that your first, your first program always, always, always. And I, by the way, I hope you guys are following along with this. If you are new to coding or you want to learn, please, please, please follow along with this. I, this is, I cannot stress that watching can be helpful, but doing actually, even, even if you're just copying what I'm doing on the screen, which hopefully you also play around a little bit. I'll try and leave some room for that. But 
actually just typing it out and getting and doing it yourself will make you feel so much more empowered to just go and start things after the words. So our first uh, thing that we're going to do is it's called a hello world program. So what this is going to do is this is just going to say hello world. Look, we got type in print hello world. This says hello world right back at us. Perfect. That's actually exactly what we want. So why is this like the standard thing? How does this work? Why did it say hello world? Well, as you can guys imagine, kind of like a printer, right? We have a print statement. Print usually means to print something to the screen. So as opposed to paper, you're putting it on the screen. And this says hello world. So we pass in and you'll see that there's these little quotation marks. This is basically saying this is a string. So what exactly is a string? Some people may have heard this before, uh, this like term. A string is basically a series of characters. It's a series of letters. And sometimes they're gonna be numbers, sometimes they're gonna be other things, but a string is always between two quotes. And it doesn't always have to be the double quotes. It can actually be the single quotes as well. So you guys can see it's all about the same. What a string is, is what we call a variable, all right? Now, variables are basically the first tool. This is like the tier one unit in our StarCraft builder, all right? This is the most basic unit that we're going to have to worry about, okay? We're going to be using these a lot. Now, we have strings. So strings can be, hello world, one, two, three, four. And that's also a string. So the numbers can be included. You can include all sorts of different things. You can include, you know, dollar signs. You can include all kinds of obscenities here, whatever you want, all right? So that is what a string is. Now, there is a difference now because I typed in one, two, three, right? That's a string one, two, three. You can see it because it has a little quotation marks. Now, the second type of thing is that you actually just have a number. Now, if I don't type in one, two, three with a number, something different's gonna happen. We get one, two, three without the quotation marks. And that's because it's actually storing it as a number. You have to, this is a little bit of a confusing thing that you have to get used to. But for programming languages, there is a difference between the number one, two, three and a string that says one, two, three. It is a little bit tricky to get used to, but think of it like this. One, two, three. If I add one to this, you expect this to become 124. And that's what we get, 124. By the way, you can do little arithmetic and stuff in this as well already. But if I do one, two, three plus one, something weird is gonna happen. And this is gonna be the first error that we encounter. You're gonna see what it looks like when we make a, make a mistake, basically. Which, again, no harm, no foul. Programming is a lot of time about making mistakes, quickly correcting them, and then learning. So you see, this is what an error looks like. It says, all these confusing, scary words like trace back and file standard in, line one, all this stuff. Don't worry too much about this for now. We're not gonna worry about a lot of it. All you need to worry about is that last line, usually. It says type error can only concatenate. And if you just Google dictionary concatenate, it basically just means to append or to add to something. So you can't add a string uh, or a str non, not int to string. So basically this is saying you can't add an integer, which is like our numbers to a string. So instead what we can do is we can say int one, two, three, plus one. So this will take our string and turn it into an integer. And we get 124. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, just keep it in mind. You might run into a problem with this later on. For now, we're actually not gonna be dealing with it too much. We're not gonna have to worry too much about the difference between strings and numbers too much. Now, those are our first two tier one units, okay? Our third tier one unit, which is pretty much the last tier one unit we're gonna talk about, is something called a Boolean. Now, you always hear in all the random media stuff like, oh, zeros and ones for software development, all that stuff. A zero usually will represent a state of false. So we have a Boolean value of false. 
And then of course the opposite of that is going to be true. A one usually represents true. So the way that this works is that this basically just is a holding a value of true or false. That's all you need to know. It's actually that simple. The only values a Boolean can have are true, false, or one last thing, which actually any of these variables can hold a value of, which is none. None is kind of just exactly what it sounds like. It's nothing. It means that you really don't have anything there. You might actually have heard this particular uh, none referred to as null in a lot of cases. And it's a little bit different than zero. Kind of similar to how the string one is not the same as the number one with, the, uh, with or without the quotation marks. Zero is not quite the same as none. They're a little bit different but sometimes they can sort of be treated similarly. So all you have to know is that none is basically the absence of something. It's just saying that we don't actually have anything for this. So we have strings, we have numbers, we have booleans, which are our true or false thing, and we have none. Cool, that, those are the four variable types that we're gonna worry about, okay? So, what can we do with this information? We know how to print strings and we know how to do a bunch of other stuff, right? So we can print uh, 10 plus 10 is equal to, and we're gonna do something cool. We're going to say plus, so we can add strings together to basically concatenate the strings. So if I said, actually an easier example before we do this is hello space plus world. So this will print our hello world program, but we're adding the strings together. So this is just gonna put them straight together exactly as you would kind of expect. That's what an addition you would expect would be. Now. Instead, we're gonna do this. Um, 10 plus 10 is equal to, and we're gonna say plus, and now we're going to do something called S, we're gonna cast something to a string. So this is gonna be, remember we were talking about this before, you wanna treat an, a number like a string. So we can say 10 plus 10. So this is going to do 10 plus 10, which is 20, we know it's 20. It's gonna treat it, it's gonna do that calculation, and then it's gonna evaluate this string, or this as a string right here, and turn it into the string 20 as opposed to the number 20. And with that, we can add it to the string, and it'll say 10 plus 10 equals is equal to 20. Hey, perfect. So we can do fun stuff like this, but let's be real, guys. This is not super duper useful. So instead, let's figure out how can we keep a hold of some of these variables. Now, variables are important because they are the way that we're storing a lot of information usually. So let's say we're, you're from a math class or something, you're probably gonna familiar, be familiar with the idea of saying like one plus two is equal to X or something. So, oh, whoops, wrong side. We're gonna say X is equal to one, plus two. Now, in a math sense, you would say, okay, well, X is equal to three here. And exactly as you'd expect, X is equal to three. It's done the math for you. You can also say X is equal to 10. And X is now equal to 10. Now, watch this. I can actually say X is equal to X plus five. Now, this is going to take that value that X had before and it's going to add five to it and then put it back in X. So we're gonna end up with X is equal to 15. Really, really simple. So variables are the way that we store information, all right? This is how our, we're going to be able to start doing things that are more interesting. So we can say something along the lines of Let's say we have, oh, I don't know, uh, a bunch of numbers, right? We have 
A is equal to 1, B is equal to 2, C is equal to 3, D is equal to 4, and E is equal to 5. Well, we can actually get the sum and say sum is equal to A plus B plus C plus D plus E, and we'll put a little parenthesis around this, divided by, and that's five letters, so, wait, that's five letters, right? Okay, yeah, five letters. Whoop. Sorry, made a mistake there. I added a little backspace. Cool. And our sum is equal to three, because one plus two plus three plus four plus five, sum of that is gonna be three. Perfect. So, we can do cool stuff like that, but uh, we don't really wanna have to type in a is equal to 1, B is equal to 2, C is equal to 3, D is equal to 4, E is equal to 5, so on and so forth, right? That's not useful to us because we want to actually start getting usefulness out of this coding. We've already spent like, what, 30 minutes learning how to code and we haven't actually done anything that would be considered really useful. I mean, if we wanted to type in print world into, or sorry, hello world into like a notepad file or something, we could type in hello world. We don't need to type in print hello world. That's more work. So, how can we start making this useful? Well, there's another thing. This is gonna be like our tier two units, all right? Because we covered our tier one units. Strings, numbers, booleans, and none or null. Those are our tier one units. Our first tier two unit, we're only gonna talk about two of them. There are more, but you guys really don't have to worry about them for now, especially in Python. Our first tier one unit is gonna be called an array. An array is basically, just imagine it like a bunch of cubby holes, all right? Our array, it's like, it's like a warp prism or a medevac or something. It's just gonna be holding things. It, in it of itself, is not actually doing a whole lot, but it's gonna hold things, and what it can do with those things is what's really cool. So, the way that an array looks is it looks like this. It's just a left brace and a right brace. And that's an array. This is an empty cubby hole, basically. Now, let's say we want to assign this to a variable. We can do that as well. So X is now this little empty cubby hole. Now, let's say we want to add something to X. We can say x.append. And let's say we're gonna add the number one. So this is going to take that cubby hole and the last cubby hole in like our little row, we're gonna add something. Cool, we have a, a cubby hole that now has the value one. And let's say now we wanna append a value of two. Now we have our cubby hole or our medevac or whatever with one and two. Cool, we're, we're gradually storing these marines or whatever inside of our medevac, right? And what's actually really cool, and I'll say this is not typical for a lot of programming languages, is even though I've added one and two, which are numbers, I can also say, add in hello world. You know what? I know that this medevac is carrying only Marines right now, but let's let's stick a Marauder in there, all right? Let's, let's get something different. Now we have our cubby holes. Cubby hole number one is number one. Cubby hole number two is number two. Cubby hole number three, ooh, it's, it's the text, the string, hello world. It's totally different. So, this is really great because now we can actually store this big list of things. So instead of doing this up here, oh, instead of doing this up here of A is equal to one, B is equal to two, C is equal to three, D is equal to four, etc., we can say X is equal to one, two, three, four, five. And look at how much faster that was. Cool. Now we're, we've gone through our array. Now, how are we going to get the sum? Because if you recall up here, and by the way, if you're in the Python council, you can type in, uh, type or press the up arrow and it'll cycle through the stuff that you typed in before. So this is what it looked like before. This is gonna look a little bit different now because we don't actually have the variables A, B, C, D, and E anymore. We have this X. Now the way that this works, and you'll hear a lot of coders or software developers talk about this or joke about this, make really stupid memes about it. But in software development versus normal life, like if you're in normal life, I told you to count to 10, you would say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. In software development and coders, 
you say zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Counting begins at zero. So we're gonna say that this is the zeroth element in our list, in our cubby holes. This is the first, this is the second, third, and fourth. So if something has five numbers, then it's gonna go from zero to four. It's a little bit confusing, I know, but I didn't make the rules here, guys. This is just the way that life is for software development. All right, so what does that mean? How do we, first of all, even access these numbers that we've put into our copy holes? How do we take things out of it? Well, the way we do it is we use X, and then we do this left brace. We type in the index, or, you know, that 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4 of the copy hole that we want. So... Let's say we want the first element. We're gonna type in X brace zero, and that's gonna give us the number one, because that was the first element. See so yeah, how that's a little bit confusing? Zeroth index is gonna give us index or element one. Trust me, you'll get used to it, guys. But let's say you want the number three. Well, that's gonna be index two. Cool. So the way we can do our sum, if we go back up to here, is a, which was originally one, is gonna be x sub zero. This is going to be x sub one. This is gonna be x sub two, x sub three, x sub four. And we should still get the exact same value of three. Hey, perfect. Now there's something even cooler we can do here is before we had written out this number of five, and what we can actually do, this is like a special little thing that you can do with these cubbyhole lists, is that you can say something called length, which just stands for, you know, it stands for length, but you have to type it in like this, length of X. So this is gonna count how many cubby holes do we have. And what's cool about this is that we do this, right? And we get the same value of three, but let's say we say append six so now we have six things we have to make one minor modification here because we have to say x we have to add in the fifth element to get the same sum right because we have to count that last thing but this length is now just going to automatically update to six we're cool and now we get a much bigger sum a weirdly bigger sum because we accidentally erased our parenthesis. Whoop. Oh, I see. Hold on. <laughs> we actually didn't erase the parenthesis, and that was a problem. There we go. That looks a lot better. <laughs> All right. Cool. So that's how we're going to be able to get the sum here, right? So if you guys are following along, if you guys have been doing this, this still seems like a lot of work, right? The big thing here that I want to emphasize is the idea that as opposed to typing in everything like this, where you're assigning everything to one variable, or you're literally just typing in sum is equal to one plus, uh, one plus two plus three plus, plus four plus five plus six, divided by six. This will also get you that same number, but the difference here is that if we type it in like this, every single time, let's say we want to change the value of A, to 2 or 10 or something else we have to type this whole thing in again and if we add like we did before we add an extra thing to our uh, our list and we have a length of 6 we'd have to change this 5 to a 6 but instead we're just using the length variable so we don't actually have to retype this part in so how can we do that same thing where we don't have to retype in everything every single time something changes how do we take in multiple types of data and still just run the same summation operation, right? How do we still just get the sum from that? Now, that's gonna be going into something we'll talk about in a little bit, because I wanna first cover one other data structure. I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind. How can we minimize the number of ways or times that we have to like retype something to execute a sum? Mm. So, there's one other data structure that I want you guys just to be aware of, all right? 
we're not going to be using it really too much today but i just want you to be able to get aware of it because it is a very useful data structure it is called a dictionary so a dictionary think of it like this the way i like to think of dictionaries it is the closest thing to the way that we as humans think about or try and remember things if i told you to tell me how uh how much damage does a marine do and you imagine that let's say you had like one of these arrays or like these lists right like this that said here's the damage for a zealot and a, a zergling and a tempest and a carrier and all these other things if i told you to look through all of the different things inside of these like cubby holes and go find the thing i want you want you to get like that's not the way you remember things that might be the way that you physically search for things through a bunch of like cubby holes to go find something but that's not the way you would remember something right the way you remember something is you just kind of think like uh marine does you know eight damage or something like that right it just kind of comes to you so the way that dictionaries work is you have something called a key and a value easy way to remember this is just think of it as you have a passcode and when you enter in that passcode you get access to something it's almost think of it like a username right i want to get use or get the data for this particular user or something so an example of a dictionary would be something like this so we have username and let's say we're this dictionary is storing the information for uh i don't know someone's mmr right this is someone's mmr so something like that and we'll actually say that this person's mmr is like 4000 and let's say that this is actually fear dragon so we have a dictionary that says fear dragon's mmr is 4000 and we'll actually even assign this to A variable so we have a, a dictionary that has that now if we want to add more to it we can type in with this we do a brace and then we type in the player name here so let's say Cyril has a MMR of 8,000 we type in our MMR dictionary and we see that we have our player name here and we have the MMR here player name here MMR here right Cyril has an MMR of 8,000. Fear Dragon has an MMR of 4,000. You see that little colon and everything. Now, if we want to then use this dictionary to find, to actually get that uh, value, we say MMR, Fear Dragon. This is actually very similar to how we just assigned that uh, number to Cyril. But let's, we're just not going to do an equal sign. And this will give me 4,000 back. So this would be very useful if I'm writing a program that, say, has a bunch of players, has their MMR, and then I just want to go quickly get it. Because I just think, oh, yeah, Fear Dragon's MMR. I just know it off the top of my head. It's 4,000. Cyril's MMR. I know it off the top of my head. It's 8,000. But if we had stored this in, say, you know, an array or something, we'd have to go through each one of those little cubbies in the array, you know, looking through and be like, ah... Uh, is is fear dragons mmr here no it's is it here 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 oh finally found it it's like eight down you have to look through all of them a dictionary it's instant you just you just remember what it was and that's the uh, the magic of a dictionary now we'll be talking a little bit more about those a little later cool so thank you guys so much for sticking around during that first part now we're going to be moving into something a little bit different now we are going to be going from this python console that has served us so well to the way that you will probably be writing most of your actual programs. The Python console is a fantastic tool for trying things out, for learning how things work in one particular setting. But in reality, we're actually going to be probably writing files, programming files, and then running them instead of doing this where we're typing in one line at a time and executing it. Because most of the use for all these programs and stuff I've told you guys about that I've used I write the files and then I run them when I want them. I don't want to have to type in here to this console every single time. So the first thing I'm going to have to tell you guys about is you need to pick some editor. Now there are a bunch of editors available on the internet. 
some of the really common ones that you'll hear people talk about especially for python pycharm is a very big one but i actually would say don't worry about going and downloading pycharm right now unless you're watching this on youtube and you have time but even then it can be a little bit of a, a hassle just to get started with so i would actually uh, recommend for the very very initial stuff just for today try out either if you want to go try and set stuff up try out notepad plus plus or for today what i'm going to be doing i'm actually just going to be using notepad i'm literally going to be using notepad because i want this to be about showing you guys how truly easy it is to actually start writing some of these python codes okay so we're gonna go ahead and close our console now remember this uh command prompt thing maybe you've forgotten exactly how to actually pull this up i've had this sitting over here in the uh, background for a while here is the way i'm gonna actually tell you to pull this up. So I want you to create whatever folder or something you want to write your script programs into. So over here for me, you guys can see that it's actually in this, this hard drive and it's in like this thing called teaching. Now I want you to click on this over here. I want you to hold down the shift key. All right. Hold down the shift key and right click and you'll get this little context menu. Now you probably won't have this over here, but you'll see open PowerShell window here. I want you guys to click that and it should pull up a window that looks something like this. It might be a different color or whatever. Now, this is going to be the really silly part. I want you to type in start space CMD. <laughs> and now you should pull up this window over here. All right. PowerShell is basically Windows 10's newer version of the command prompt thing that you see over here. This is like the old school version, but this is the one I'm more familiar with. So I don't really want to do a tutorial. You can absolutely do stuff with Python over here, but it'll look a little bit different. For example, if I want to run a Python program, I have to add this to something called my environment variables on this side. And over here, it's not really as uh, big of a hassle. So we're just going to be closing this for now. And this is what we want. We want this command prompt thing over here. So we're going to stick this over here. Maybe put it like this because we're not going to be using it quite just yet. But we're going to be right clicking over here. We're going to say new and text file or a text document. And what we're going to call this is we're going to say um, our program.py. Uh, actually, hold on. No, we're going to say our program dot text for now. Now, the reason why we're calling it our program dot text for now is because I want to just sh let you guys, first of all, open up notepad without having to deal with a bunch of random other annoying things going on. But basic thing is you're going to open up this notepad and cool. This is, this is our first program. All right notepad it's that easy you can actually write programs in notepad if you want to i wouldn't recommend it in the future but this is just to show you guys how easy it is to get started so let us take one of our previous programs and try doing this the old way the normal way that people would actually write a program right and that's going to be to have a file we're going to write our program and then we're going to run it through our command prompt so with our file, let's do this. We're gonna do exactly like we would have done before. We're gonna type in print hello world. We're gonna hit save. Don't forget to save it. Actually, we're gonna actually do save as. And we're gonna call this our program.py. So the pi, the dot pi basically just tells your computer that this is a Python file, as opposed to a text file where you wrote down your build order in or something. The static is back. Oh my God, that's actually so annoying. Okay. Let's see. Hmm. I have no idea what my static keeps acting up. If the static just keeps returning, I'll just kill the music entirely. But okay. So, we have over here, print hello world. 
We've saved this into our program file. We actually don't need this text file anymore, so we can just delete that. I just wanted to get you guys to open up the notepad file. Now, what we're going to do over here is we're going to type in Python, and then we're going to type in our program.py, which is the name of our program. And you should see hello world pop out. Hey, we ran a pro we ran a program. It's that easy, guys. And this should work if you installed Python with all the default settings. It should be in your environment variables and stuff, I believe. Um, if it isn't, then I promise I'll make some extra little thing at the end of this video. So we have our way to run our program. And what's cool over here is that we can say, let's say, let's take some of the stuff that we used before. We have our, uh, you know, numbers is equal to one, two, three, four, five. We're gonna say our sum is equal to x sub one plus x sub two plus x sub three plus x sub four plus x, uh, actually, sorry, x sub zero. X sub zero, right? Because counting begins at zero. So we do that and we divide it with a little parentheses here by five. Cool. And now we can actually print out our sum. And if you see over here, look, we printed out 3.0, which is exactly what we wanted. We're running programs through the file now. And this is the way you'll typically be running programs. And the cool thing here is that now if I change this number, if I change this number to say, you know, 10 or something, and I run a program, now the output's gonna change. Because it's using, because we specified, use whatever element is in this array. We don't have to rewrite it over here and change all these other numbers and everything. In fact, we can actually make this length of x, and it should be doing the same thing. So, that's really useful. But you know, it really, really is annoying that we have to, if we add in, you know, five, and we add in a sixth element, that then we have to go back over here and type in x plus five. And if we add in a seventh element, we'll have to do x sub six and all this other stuff. So how can we make that part easier? How can we make it so that the sum is just going over everything in our list? I, you know, if you go tell like a, a person, hey, can you count however many, you know, credit cards or pieces of paper are in all of these cubbies here? And then they'll just go count all of them. You don't have to say like, oh, count the first six cubbies, and then now I want you to count the seventh cubby. You just you just tell them, count the cubbies, count the stuff in the cubbies. So, how can we do that? We're gonna be using something, another tool. This is like, this is going to our next sort of tool in the tool belt. This is like a really, really useful tool, and it's called a loop. You might have heard of this before if you've ever been around coders and stuff. Uh, there are two types of loops. The first loop is uh, called a while loop, and the second loop is called a for loop. What we're going to be using over here is called a, a for loop. Now, the way a for loop works is that loops in general are basically just saying, keep doing this until, some, until something happens. And you always tell the loop what that something is. So a for loop might look like this. For, you know, number in X. And this is what a for loop looks like. And then you'll say something here, right? So the basic idea here is it's saying for each number, for every, you can kind of think of it like this, all right? For each number that's in X, do something on that number or I should say with that number, usually. Cool. So number is basically going to be a variable. We're gonna take, so the first time, this is gonna execute right now, six times. It's gonna happen for each one of these little cubbies that we have in our uh, list. So it's gonna happen, and I'll show you guys here. We're gonna, just for now, we're just going to print number. And let's erase all of this over here, right? So it's gonna print one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Perfect, yeah. So you can see 
it goes to each one of these cubbies and just checks and says, okay, I'll print this out. Okay, I'll print this out. So this is really useful if you have one of these big lists, because now you can imagine, let's say we're going to have sum is equal to zero. We're going to start off with a sum of zero. And now we're going to go to each one of these cubbies and we're going to say sum. Remember what I said before about how you can actually say sum is equal to sum plus you know, some number or something. So this is going to take whatever number some had before and add this variable number to it and then put it back in sum. So the first time it's going to say, here, I'll actually do it like this. Uh, print sum. So you guys will see each time final sum uh, sum okay so now this is just going to go through it'll show you what the sum is at each one of these steps of the for loop and then it'll show us the final sum so first time the sum is zero because that's what our starting variable for sum was it's zero and then we add the number one to it cool and then we go to the next iteration. We're looking at this element now. And we already see over here that the sum is now gonna be one because that previous iter time that we went through the for loop, we added one to it. Now we're gonna add two to it. So now the sum should be three. And that's what the value is next time. Then after that, it ends up being six because, yeah, six because we add the value of three. That ends up being the value of 10 because we add four to six and then we add five and then eventually we add six and we get a final sum of 21. Now this is really cool because now we can actually just say average is equal to sum divided by length of x. And we can say the average is this and let's actually even just get rid of this print statement so we're just going to say this is the average and the average is 3.5 and what's really cool here is that now we can actually add in a bunch of numbers we can add in like crazy large numbers we can add in you know six we can remove this number and all we have to do is just modify those numbers and then we run our program and we still get the same or like the, the correct average because this, none of this cares about how X changes anymore. So remember we were talking about this before. How do we minimize the amount of work that's required? And this is the way we do it. We make it so that none of these are directly specifying, you know, use index zero and index one and index two and index three and index four. Because every single time we add a new index, we'd have to type in add index six or seven but our for loop is just going to go through every index so if we the number of index changes if the cubby holes change in the sense that we have more of them and we tell someone go count the number or you know all the numbers in these cubbies they're just going to count all the numbers in the cubbies we don't have to tell them go count all the numbers in these cubbies and by the way there are six cubbies and then somehow there are eight cubbies and the person just ignores the other two you don't have to worry about that anymore so this is really, really useful. And this is actually going to be the first step that we need to start taking advantage of things and actually start doing really cool stuff. So with this, we know how to make an average, but let's let's take the average of something more interesting, guys. And I know you guys have you've stuck with me for almost an hour at this point. It's finally time, one hour in, let's talk about how you can do cool stuff because I will and I'm sure all of the people in the chat who are already software developers and everything are going to start telling me fear dragon come on like there's still so much you haven't talked about you haven't talked about functions you haven't talked about classes you haven't talked about how dictionaries are properly used or all these other things you know what don't worry about it guys because the thing about software development and coding and the cool thing about coding is that you can sort of just learn stuff as you go a lot of the time. And especially if you're a hobbyist code coder, that is, I think, the best way to just go about things. As you need something, 
you go learn about it. And I think that is one of the most intimidating things about software development and coding that turns a lot of people off is people feel like, okay, similar to like the people who try and play StarCraft and they say, I'm going to play versus an AI until I my build order is absolutely perfect. And then I'll go out into the world. It's like, no, you, you can just start working. Just start doing stuff now and you'll figure things out as you ladder. That's usually going to be a much better way to actually get started. So... With that being said, let's talk about three things, all right? I'm going to tell you guys about three special little tools you'll need for this next part, okay? And you don't have to you don't have to do anything super duper crazy, all right? But we're going to actually going to be starting to go to some websites now. And we're going to I'm going to show you guys what it looks like to try and develop something. And I will say I have not tried doing this beforehand. This is, this is going to be a somewhat unplanned section. I'm going to show you guys what it's like to... I've, I've only looked a little bit at this. Very, very little bit. I'm going to show you guys what it's like to try and use someone else's code. Because remember, I was telling you guys, a lot of coding is about taking the gears, the different gears that other people have made, and learning how to use them and plug and play to get something that you want. And that's what we're going to do. So we're going to use... This wonderful, wonderful library that someone called, uh, basically the creator of GG Tracker, which is a great website and has actually been used for a lot of people to try and look through replays and try and learn a little bit. So they've written this wonderful thing called the library. A library is basically just one of those gears. It is a tool that you can use to do things. So they have this, uh, library called SC2 Reader. The way that SC2 Reader works is... It's actually really, really simple. You basically just say, hey, I want to use SC2 Reader. And this is something called an import. This is saying, I want to use this person's tool. So after you've installed the tool, you say import SC2 Reader. And then you just literally can copy paste in more or less this line. But you replace this part over here, my replay, with the name of your replay. And you can even probably get rid of this. You don't actually don't need this, but we'll talk about that later. So you basically say, hey, SC2 Reader, I want your tool to go load the replay. And here's the name of the replay. And then you get this little thing here. And this little thing has a bunch of the information that we want. So the information we're going to go with is game time. Because, you know, we're pretty hot. We're pretty hot shit developers, guys. We wrote... A program that can take the average of something why not take the average of a bunch of game times so you guys can actually see over here I have this folder called replays and we're gonna use all the things that we've learned about today and maybe two or three more things that I'll teach you guys about as we're writing this program to try and get the average game length of all the replays that we played on Acropolis so you guys can see we have 26 replays from Acropolis and we're going to try and read the game or get the game length from using this library and that's going to be the special part and then we're just going to run it through this the rest of this so let's first talk about the first thing that we're going to need the first thing we're going to need is something called this is a magical thing in Python this is this will make your life so much easier. A lot of other programming languages are a lot more difficult about this. This is part of the reason why I actually wanted to teach you guys about Python first. It is something called PIP, P-I-P. So you guys will find Python 3 get PIP. And you guys will see actually, there's a bunch of great websites that'll tell you how to do this. So if you need to do this, you guys can go ahead and look for Windows. Uh, hold on on Windows. Sorry, I forgot to do that part. So you guys can see over here, this teaches you, okay, I need to get pip. So uh, check if pip is already installed. So for us, actually, pip is already installed because we'll type in pip and we'll get this big thing over here that tells you how to use pip. Pip is how we're going to tell Python that we want to use someone else's tool. And it'll just go get that person's tool for us. We don't have to worry about how to actually get it or any of that junk. So, next thing that we have to do, it says over here, if you don't have Pip, verify you have Python. Of course, we do have Python. So, we're good over there. 
and it should say all this. So the way it says get pip is you literally go over here and you actually download it. It's actually just this file. You hit over here, you hit control S and you save it to you know somewhere useful and everything. And then from there, you're gonna do that whole, remember opening up this command prompt? We actually already have that. So I'd actually recommend saving it to wherever your command prompt is. So for example, mine is my command prompt is in my R hard drive and the teaching folder, okay? So you're gonna open that up. You're going to then run that get pip, that file that you just downloaded using Python get pip. Actually not too dissimilar to how we ran our program over here. When we were running our program, we did Python our program.py. This is Python and their program, get pip.py. And cool, you should have pip now. So what I want you guys to do from here is this whole thing. And I want GitHub is basically a very, very common place where a lot of these tools or these gears exist. This is where people tend to put them, especially the ones that other people can use. So when you're on this website, you might encounter little gears and or little tools that you say, I think I could do something cool with that. So you go down over here after you open up to this, like this is called the repository. This is where all their code is. This is, I mean, you can see there's like text files and dot uh, like MDs and RSTs and all these other crazy things. All we care about right here is this thing called readme.rst. This has all the information that we're usually going to need. So it says, this is what this thing does. It's a Python 2 library that gets information about different StarCraft 2 things. So it, you can read information about replays, maps, game summaries, all kinds of stuff. Even actually acts as support for Battle.net profiles and everything. Who uses SC2 Reader? This talks about, you know, some websites like gamereplays.org, spawningtool.com, ggreplays.com tools, the core, etc. So this just has a bunch of information that the person who made this tool thinks is important for us. So this talks about, oh, this is like what it can do and all this stuff. But what we care about almost always, most good repositories or libraries will have this little thing that just says installation. Cool. So what we want to do, remember we were talking about pip, PIP? All you have to do is type in, and I've already done this, so maybe I'll actually you can ignore this line really quickly. I'll just, I'll do this so that we can walk through this together. All right. Oop. Come on. There we go. All right. Now it's taking up the full screen. So I'm going to type in pip install sc2 reader because that's what this is telling me to do right here. We do that. And cool. It's installed. Successfully installed. We now have our tool. We can read replays now, guys. Isn't that cool? Isn't that awesome? And actually, if we go back, remember our Python console? We're actually going to test this. We're going to make sure that this works before we start writing into random like pieces of like text files or Python files and then running them. Like that's that's too much overhead. Let's just see if this works, okay? So we saw this line up here. Let's see how realistic this is, okay? Where is it? Um, right here. It said, this is all you have to do. For many users, the most basic commands will handle all of their needs. Import sc2 reader. Import sc2 reader. We're just gonna straight copy this. Cool, it, it ran. It, like, I mean, if I type in gibberish or something, this will break. But this didn't break. It, it said, cool, it just, it just worked. So we have our sc2 reader. The way that these tools work is you say import this, which is basically saying, hey, I did this pip install on this. I know that this tool exists. I've downloaded this tool. It exists on my hard drive now. I want to use it. I want to use it in this program. So, um, and yes, uh, to answer a good question from Tal, uh, Tal Jacob in the chat right now, it does know SC2 Reader just through the internet. There is a whole complicated thing that we really don't have to go into uh, right now, which there is a really, really nice list that other people are maintaining. That's all you really have to know, that other much smarter people than us are maintaining, that it just has a list of all of the different libraries and tools and everything. So a lot of this stuff is just this simple to install in Python, and that's what makes it so magical. 
but we've basically told Python, we have this library installed, we wanna use it. Import SC2 Reader. And now we said, okay, so now it's almost like SC2 Reader is a little bit like a variable now. So we're gonna actually say, we're gonna create a variable. This is gonna be our replay, right? Cause we're, we're copying this line basically, right? And we're gonna say SC2 Reader, which is the, the library that we imported. We said, we're gonna use this tool and this tool has something called a load replay. And this is called a function. We'll talk about functions in a second. Don't worry too much about it for right now. All right, I'm actually gonna handle, even though we're gonna be using a function here, we're gonna talk about functions later, all right? You don't need to know too much about it. All you need to know is that if you type in literally this line of code, it will load something. So let's actually go back to our directory over here. I have all these files. Let's just pick one. We're gonna take Acropolis 26, all right? And we're gonna paste it over here. And we're gonna copy this file name. Uh, Acropolis LE space 26 dot SE2 replay. And hopefully I didn't misspell that. Now this also has this whole load map thing. And if actually, I'll just tell you now, we don't actually need that because it talks about this later. If you want to load the map with it, you can. But like we said, we're just interested in the average. We just want to calculate the average game length across a bunch of replays. So we don't actually need the map for that. The, the map has no impact on the game length, I would assume. So we're just going to do this. And I'm going to note again, I have actually not done any of this before. So this is all also new to me. I'm telling you guys, for the most part, everything as I am looking and reading about all this. So this is to give you guys an idea of what it's like to try and piece some of these tools together. Okay, so no such file, Acropolis LE. So that means that we probably typoed in the name wrong. Um, we're gonna go back to our directory thing here. Let's see if we can just copy paste this name in. All right. Shift insert, no. Okay, so that part's not working. Let's see, do we typo this? A lot of the time we would just, will typo something and that is gonna cause a lot of problems. Um, a crop o list space le right click paste I am doing oh hold on shift right click no and that's okay you know what that's fine because we can always just use our good old notepad file so we're gonna have all this over here we're gonna do the same thing though all right Let's just move all this stuff down. Our program will still just calculate the sum for now. But we're gonna say import sc2 reader. And over here we can control paste and say, actually, we don't need this to be this big anymore. Yeah, something like that will be good. Okay, and we're gonna copy paste this line right here. We're gonna paste it in. We're gonna remove the load map equals true because we don't need that. And we're going to copy this name and replace this. Okay, now let's see if our program errors. Does it error? No, it doesn't. So that means that it didn't hit in any kind of like snags or anything. So I can do something like this. It's probably not gonna tell me anything very interesting, but it'll at least confirm that. Cool, yeah, it's, so this is the way that Python says like, there was this thing that wasn't a normal variable. It's not a string, it's not an integer. It's like this, what we call an object. And we'll talk about objects another time. We really don't need to know too much about it. All you need to know is this object is going to exist now. We've read in that replay. So. What we're going to do now is I will just tell you that what we can do is I believe, and this is the one thing I did check, is that if you look into this, there's a docs section. Docs is usually stands for documents. So I said, okay, that sounds interesting. These files over here, a make file and a make.bat. For those who don't know, encoding 
These are usually just common files you'll see because they help you to create a program. Once you have a program, you usually make these to, to like create something. We're not worried about that. We're just trying to learn more about the, how the hell do you use this tool? Once I have this replay variable set, what do I do with it? And I'll say, as you guys can probably see over here, I've already figured this, this part out. And basically you can go through, usually when I'm looking through docs, if I see something like an index, index is kind of like a home page thing. So that's usually a good starting point. You guys can see over here, here's a manual. I'm a bad person, so I don't read through all the manuals, but it says, oh, this is like about better statistics, yada, yada, yada. This is really boring. Oh, SE2 reader. Okay, it has some licensed stuff going on. Cool. Um, here's all the stuff it can do. Yeah, yeah, that's all good. Uh, what I want, what's in a replay? That sounds interesting, right? This is what I care about. So it says, getting started, I recommend these. So the installation guide, cool, we already installed. We're good on that. Read this article on replays. So I try to click on this article. It doesn't actually do anything, but I notice that it says, and I think this is just like a broken link. Sometimes this will happen. But you notice it says, doc, articles, what's in a replay. This kind of looks like a folder. So I hit back and I'm like, okay. Articles, there's an articles folder. And hey, what's in a replay? We found it, all right? Sometimes you just gotta use your head a little bit, try and navigate through. Not everyone's good at documenting the, the you know, how, teaching people how to use their tools. So we look over here, it has a bunch of different things. You guys can see, oh, you can like access a bunch of things by typing in replay dot such and such or replay dot such and such. So I'll say, I read through the documents for a little bit. I found that you can do replay dot length dot seconds and this is will give you the number of seconds in the replay so this replay was 555 seconds long awesome that's that's great cool and we can actually just double check that um i actually forgot to do this part so we're gonna load up starcraft actually and just go check and verify that that is correct because it's always good to just do some sanity checks here make sure that everything is kind of as you expect so this replay was acropolis 26 so as i load up starcraft and everything and log in and go to that file we'll check this out in a second but a lot of this part of the process is just about trying to do research if you're not sure about anything during this part it seriously is really really simple to just go look it up so you guys will see over here that we're in starcraft we found the replay Acropolis, this is Acropolis 26. Seven minutes and 35 seconds. Okay, seven minutes, 35 seconds. And the number that we got was 455. So we had minutes in there. Let's use our calculator really quickly. I've never seen calculator take this long to load. That's actually crazy. My calculator isn't loading, guys. Okay, well, we're just gonna do it on our phone now. <laughs> Screw you, calculator. Wow, that's crazy. So, we're going to say 7 minutes, so 7 times 60. That's 420. And then it said uh, 725 or something. Uh, or sorry, 735, 735. So then add 30, uh, 35. And cool, that's 455. That's what we have, that's what we have up there. I crashed calculator. Math on stream, exactly. Math with a calculator. So cool, this is actually how long that game was. Isn't that amazing? So, we have a program that looks at a replay file and prints out how long it is. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that so cool? So, now that we have that, how do we combine this with this sum thing and maybe use the for loop somehow? Hmm. Should I use the console to calculate this? Maybe, maybe. I mean, I've got to say, this is this is a first for me to crash calculator. But okay, guys, we've done this. I think we actually have enough information from our uh, from this, so we don't need that for right now. Let's just move this over here because it's going to be our main focus now, right? Let's verify one other thing because I have all these replays in here also. So we're going to delete this replay file. This is just a copy. Apparently we also have a new text document here. We don't need that. 
So we're going to try and see if we can get it to read from our replay file. So this, we're just gonna read it like this. Replay, and then it's like saying, take the current folder, enter the replay folder, and then access this file. So we're gonna make sure that that works. Ah, yeah, see, so good thing that we tested that because we're having some trouble with that. Uh, sometimes Windows actually uses the other, like it back, it's, it's a backslash instead of a forward slash. So let's try that. Hmm, still not working. Okay, so we have to try and figure out what the deal is with that. Now, instead of getting hung up on this, we're going to just do something simple. We're just going to copy paste all of our replays into this folder. All right. So now we don't have to worry about that problem at all. See? And then we can punt that problem for later. Oh, I missed I missed an S? Oh, okay. You know what? You know what? All right. All right. Hold on. Hold on. See? This is why backseat cha uh, chat can actually be great. All right. So let's try this. Uh, replays Acropolis. Hey, okay, it worked. Cool. So we missed an S. And of course, you guys are always going to have, like, this is this is part of coding. You're going to have a bunch of really, really stupid bugs like this where you, you typoed something and nothing works. And you're going to realize later on, or you have some wonderful people in chat to call things out. And that's just part of life. You'll get better at this as you go. Or in my case, you'll gradually get worse at it. But stay in Diamond League and continue just cannon rushing your way to victory basically uh yeah coding starcraft basically the same thing cool so we're reading from our file now let's think how can we make this part work in our for loop right because the way that we want to do this is we want to go over all of these so we're definitely going to be putting this this is going to go inside of our for loop up oh. this is going to go inside of our for loop over here right we want something like this but we want this to not just read Acropolis 26 over and over and over again we want it to read Acropolis 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 all this other stuff so we're gonna use a special little tool so remember how we have this four number in X Python is really cool and it actually has a bunch of other special things that you can use for specific situations. So we're going to use something called range. Uh, oh, sorry, actually, no, it's a, it's enumerates is what we want. And new, actually, no, we do want, yeah, we do want enumerate. So the way that this works is we actually, no, no, sorry, 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 sorry. I'm, I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid. We do want range. We want range. Okay. Uh, so we're going to say from 1 to 26. The way that this works is this is going to be the equivalent of creating an array of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, dot, 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 24, 25, 26. This is going to give us just an array. And it's going to the same way we would try and iterate over our previous array. This would iterate over it or uh, iterate over it in the same way. So we're going to say this for range in 1 to 26 again you could do this the same way by just creating an array first but this is just a little bit easier we're going to still have our sum variable that's still going to be useful and what we're going to do over here is we're going to say this is going to be like the string right so this is going to look a little bit crazy and we can actually do this maybe in over here so we're going to say map name that's the name of this variable it's called map name so we're going to take this right here. We're going to copy this over here. And we want to replace this with the number, right? Because we're going to go to Acropolis 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. Right? Can't you do number? Exactly, tall, uh, tall Jacob. So we're going to replace this with whatever number is. So remember how we did our string concatenation? So we're going to say that this is one string. We're going to add in string number. And then we're going to add in the rest of this string like this. So it's a little bit hard to read, but you guys can see over here, we're taking our original uh, like uh, location for our replay. This is like the first part of it. We're just sticking in the number. We're just sticking in the number one, two, three, four, whatever. 
and then we are have the rest of that replay file location, right? So we're going to do that, and then we're going to load in that new replay. And we're going to pass in over here. We're going to... This is where originally the replay thing was. Be sure not to add in unnecessary blank space. I don't think we have a blank space over here. I think we're good on that. Is there any way to automate what number you want? Clickety, that's exactly what we're doing, though. Um, or are you talking about this number? Yes. But you know what? Let's just get something working. A lot of the best developers are actually not the ones that are sitting there coding everything perfectly, exactly how it should work in the final form the first time, right? We're, we're Dragon Ball Z characters here. We gradually step up our power levels, all right? We gradually get to our final form. No one just starts in their final form, okay? That's not fun because you won't get anything working that way. You gotta, you gotta test your might. You gotta test the other person's might, see how strong they are. Or in this case, we have to test to make sure our program freaking works. And then we can worry about making it look nice and all this other stuff. So for now, we're gonna do this. It's gradual process. Um, and yes, actually, if Kawhi Rice is bringing this up in the chat, but there are a bunch of libraries available, including for SC2 Reader, in all other sorts of languages. We're just starting with Python because I think it's really easy to start to pick up initially. So we're reading through all these replays. We're going to print them out. And then we're going to sum up. We don't want this number. We actually, we're going to say re oh, replay length is equal to replay.length.seconds. Because remember, that's what this is, right? This is how we got that replay length, and we're gonna print out the replay length. And then we're going to, instead of adding our number, which is just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, all the way to 26, we want the replay length. That's what we're actually creating a sum, uh, sum for. So we get the total sum of all of the replay lengths, and then this part is already done, right? Average is the sum divided by However many replays we looked at, the length of uh, length of x, which in this case, it's not the length of x, it's just going to be 26. And again, we'll worry about fixing this later on. And then we're going to print out the average. So let's see if this works. Oh my god, look at this. We got all these replays. Wow, I had a long replay. All right, so we almost got through. We almost got through everything. We see 26 different replay lengths, apparently... Some of them are really short. They're like 15 seconds long. And then we got this error. And remember, I said, don't worry about a lot of these other things you, before. Read the last line. There's usually two things that will matter, right? The last line will tell you what the error is. So this says object of type int has no length. And the other thing that you're going to care about is this over here. You don't, this will, you always just say trace back or whatever. This is telling you line 11. And this, so this is the file. This is the line that's a problem on. So line 11 of this file. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. That's over here. And this is the line that actually caused the problem. And it said, we try to call this thing on int. Oh, yeah, sorry. That's my bad. Don't worry too much about that. I was, if you recall before, it was length of X, which was an array. And we were saying, how many cubbies are there? We don't need to call length of 26. 26 is literally the number that we want. So we'll try running this again. Calculating all those numbers. Awesome. And we have an average game length, an average game length of 438 seconds. But you know what? Let's, let's format this, all right? We're not done yet. Um, let's say, we want to keep minutes and seconds. Okay, so how can we do that? Uh, I'm not reading replay 26. You are right. This is... You're actually right. I've, that was my bad. Yes. So, with this, it's actually... I forgot. Range is actually creating... Going from index 1 to 25. Because it's inclusive on this number and exclusive on this number. So, basically, it's... Because if I told you, say, like, between 1 and 10, that means that I'm... Usually, if I say, like, you know, what's what's your opinion of this on a scale from 1 to 10? That means you're saying inclusive if you include the number 1 and if you include the number 10. 
the way that this works, this specific thing here, this is just a quirk of a lot of coding stuff, is it's saying, what's your opinion on a range from 1 to 11, which is actually from 1 to 10. Anyways, yes. And now we're actually getting the appropriate average with this extra little bit over here. Well, our last game was exactly our average almost. It was really, really close. There's no Acropolis uh, LE zero. Yeah, yeah. And that's why we're starting from one. Could you do zero to 26? No, so Cliggity, if you recall, the reason why we're doing this number here, the reason why we're doing like this range from one to 26 is because this is the, the name of our replays. The name of our replays has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way up to 26. That is the reason why we started with one. Mm. And as a fun fact, if you did, here, I'll show you guys, instead of just telling you guys, this is a Python interpreter. So we said like range one to 27. Does that really not do anything? Oh my God, that's actually so silly. I've actually never tried this before. Wow, it actually just returns. That's so silly. Okay, well, anyways, this is the equivalent of, let's say, like, range 1 to 5. This is the equivalent of 1, 2, 3, 4, in a sense. It looks like Python at a deeper level doesn't represent it that way, but that's a, basically what you're going to be getting back, in a sense. If you said, but you can also do, like, range 5 to 10, or like five to 11. And that would end up being five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So that's the way that that works. So isn't that cool though, guys? I mean, with fairly minimal amounts of extra stuff, we're able to take our previous program, use someone else's tool and read these replays. Now we're gonna do one last thing, and this is just gonna to be to clean up our code a little bit, all right? We are going to do something called making a function. So this is gonna make our program look really nice and clean because maybe we want to make this just like something we can do later on in our, fun or our program. Maybe we wanna do this multiple times. So the way we can do this is we can say in Python, and this looks different in different languages, we say def, and we're gonna create a function name. And actually, if you look over here, this right here is a function. The way functions are called, or basically you have some function name. So we're gonna say, uh, we're gonna call this fun uh, program average. Or actually, we'll, we'll first make a sum function, okay? So we'll say sum, we're going to, or say sum replace, replay lengths. Sometimes naming, functions is the hardest part about coding. Um, so we're going to create this. And the way that this works is we're going to copy all of this stuff over here. And we're going to put it over here. Oh, actually, we're supposed to grab this also. And this. So we're copying all of this. And we're going to tab this in. Now, something I didn't really talk too much about before, but basically the way that Python works is the further something is tabbed in, you can see like everything over here is tabbed in further than the for, the for loop over here. And that means that all of this is happening for each iteration of the for loop. With this, all of this stuff is tabbed in once extra underneath the function definition, all right? And that means that all of this belongs to the function definition. In Python, tabs, and, and like in other languages, you'll oftentimes see this represented with like curly braces like this, or like this. So this just means all of this belongs to this for loop, or all of this belongs to this function definition. But that's just in, uh, in other languages, you'll have the braces. In Python, you just do it with tabs. The loose syntax is making me anxious, yeah. So we're gonna move everything over here. And then at the very end, the way that functions work is we have something called return. And return will say, whoever uses this function, 
Kind of like how, remember this whole this whole load replay thing over here? This gives us back the information that holds, or like the data structure that holds all of our replay information. So in this case, we got back that, and we assigned it to a variable of replay. We want to let other people, including ourselves, actually, uh, to do the same thing with this function here. So we're going to return the sum. And that means when, just like over here, someone decides to call this function, and the format for a function call is like this, we say, we just say the, the name of the function, sum replay length. And then to indicate it's a function, we add parentheses like this. And we're going to say sum is equal to this. Cool. And that should now do this. It will call sum replay length, which is over here. And now it'll get the sum of all of these replays. And then it'll return the sum. So that's one quick way that we can do this. And we can actually even break this up even more. Inside of a function, we can actually get or like add in another function. So we can say uh, get replay length. And we'll say we'll pass in a number. So this is what we call a parameter. All right. This is basically the way that we say, hey, I had this variable and I need this function to do something. But this function, you you, pro you need to get some information. It's like if I, you go tell a friend, like, hey, can you go get the stuff from my cubby? You have to go tell them which one is your cubby. So you might pass in a, a variable of, like, you know, cubby X or something, or cubby 7, whatever. A cubby with my name on it. That is basically what we're doing. We're saying, hey, this is like a little robot dude. And we're telling it, hey, this is... The process that you have to go through and here's the information you need to ex to do that process so we're going to actually have this we're going to copy all of this stuff over here out to here and we're going to pass in remember we had that name number so now number is just going to be passed in from here and we're going to say uh replay length is equal to get replay length and we're going to pass in the number like this so with this you can get the replay length and you can see so this this over here this is like our main program is calling this function over here and this function actually calls this function a bunch of times and this is a really good example because imagine if we didn't have the for loop or something. We'd be writing this. We'd be basically copy pasting this 26 times or something crazy like that, right? And we'd be changing the replay name and everything. So this is all functions are great for doing duplicated work multiple times or in different places. You can reuse this. So maybe later on, we're going to have, we're going to extend the, the power of this program or something. And we're going to be able to make it do other things as well. And that's what this is all really about. This is all about just being able to uh, extend, like make this easier to use later on. Make it extensible. So we're going to do one last thing, okay? Typically, you don't actually just want all of these like things just sitting around like this. So there's one final step we're going to do for today's lesson, all right? This is going to look like absolute nonsense. And I'll just tell you, just do it all right this is just the way this is just the way that python has told you to do it okay if name underscore underscore name is equal to underscore underscore main so and then we're gonna say main and we're gonna this part should make sense def main we're gonna we're just gonna create a thing that's called main this is like a function where name we're calling name we're gonna move it into this so now our main function this is basically just saying like this is where the main part of our program is executing and this is just saying when you go through and load up this file call our main function don't worry about what this line means or why this works or anything like that this is literally just in almost all Python programs this is just saying hey 
I have a bunch of functions in here. Python, this is the one you want to call. This is what you should be doing when you when I tell you to run. So if we didn't screw anything up and we run this again, and we did screw something up, unsupported type. Uh, so remember, sometimes we only care about usually this line right here. And usually if we're just worrying about our own, or our own code, this line right here. So line 15 of this file. So does this actually, oh, this does have line numbers down here. Oh, awesome. Okay, so line 15 right here. We are trying to add sum to replay length. Oh, we, we didn't actually return replay length. Return replay length. Remember, we have to return this back so that when this gets called, it actually does that. So yeah, sometimes you'll have some bugs in there. And now look, this is working as it was before. And yeah, we got the average again. Cool. Now, again, I want to emphasize, there's a lot of stuff that we haven't covered here so far. And I might actually do some uh, more of these kind of lessons in the future, I might try and cover things like conditional operators. What is a class? Uh, more about functions, about default options for functions or default uh, variable parameters. I might talk about more in dictionaries and everything, but this was made to be something to get you guys just from super duper ground level, get you guys the bare minimum information to work on something cool, which I think this is really cool. I said this before, I had never touched this library before today. I barely, barely looked a little bit at the documentation of it, just to make sure this is not gonna be some rabbit hole for the stream. But I did a lot of my research also on the stream and I showed you guys the exact steps that I took to find the information I wanted and everything. A lot of this is just gonna be a Googling. That is, you're gonna feel maybe a little bit silly and feel like, oh man, I have no idea what I'm doing and everything. That is perfectly normal. Software development, I mean, think of it like this. Trying to pretend or like trying to feel like you know everything in software development or know everything in advance is like trying to say, I can, I have practiced and executed every single build order for all three races. That's just unrealistic. No one, not even the best pro players in the world, not even a pro player who plays random has practiced every single, all of the different build orders out there that are typically used. No one has done that to a proficient level. Everyone is learning. Everyone is gonna be Googling or, lear or trying things out. There's some great resources out there. When you Google, you'll find a website called Stack Overflow a lot as a place that a lot of people ask their questions. And you should also feel free to ask questions there, but most questions that you'll probably have will have been asked if you just Google for them. Do not be discouraged by being uncertain. Dive into things. Try things out. That is what coding is about. This isn't a chemistry lab. You're not gonna blow up your computer probably. It's very, very unlikely. The worst, absolute worst case is that your program might freeze your computer for like 30 seconds or something or a minute. In most cases, that is gonna be the worst case. Obviously, you can do worse, but you will probably have to be playing around with much more dangerous tools than you will find in the beginning. So. Play around with things, try things out, go learn through other guides. If you found that this was helpful, please let me know because I actually enjoy doing this stuff. Uh, I actually enjoy talking about a lot of this stuff. And I would even love to just do general other talks that are not necessarily as hands-on as this, but even just telling you guys, talking to you about how exactly, in kind of more layman's terms, how does code get read in from the computer? How does this, these words that we have on this screen, how the hell does the computer read this? Because I thought the computer only reads zeros and ones. I'd love to do talks and stuff like that. But there are a lot of other great resources out there on the internet. If I am not the perfect person for you, if you stuck around but decided uh, it wasn't quite for me, I just kind of stuck around because it was somewhat interesting, please, please, please seek out these resources. I'm telling you guys, we wrote this program. Yes, it took about an hour and a half, but look at it, it's actually not that big. And I spent a lot of time explaining and working on other stuff as well, teaching you guys about other concepts. Like we didn't really use dictionaries. We didn't use Booleans or any of this other stuff. But I was telling you about uh, guys about extra stuff. And we can now calculate the average length of a bunch of our replays. 
I think that's freaking cool. I think that's useful. And you guys now also not just have the replay length, you guys have this replay object that this other uh, this other tool, the SC2 reader gave you. You can go get more information. You can actually do a bunch of uh, cool stuff now with your own replays for StarCraft. There's other awesome libraries and stuff available. So I'd highly recommend you guys check things out. Um, but all right, guys. I think that is, for the most part, going to be it. So thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, at least for the YouTube people. I'll probably stick around for Twitch and answer some Q&A and stuff afterwards. But thank you all so much. And happy coding, guys.